Um, thanks a lot for the very kind invitation. It's good to see a lot of people in the audience to, to listen something about the best sport in the world. Uh, of course, I'm biased, but I don't care. Um, so uh, when I was invited uh, to talk about handball, it was really good because I've been away from handball for a number of years. So that allowed me to go back and revisit a few things. But that's where my passion lies, so it's very easy. But I haven't published a lot on this field, so you will see things from the real world, uh, things that come from the field, as well as si some uh, scientific literature. And I hope you'll appreciate this sport a bit more. So first of all, I would like to give you a bit of an introduction of uh, what the outline of this talk will be. Uh, we will uh, see what handball is all about. So if you don't come from handball, I hope you will understand a bit more after today's talk. Uh, I will talk to you about the physical characteristics of the players. Uh, if you've been working already at the venues uh, to provide medical support or if you've seen the games, you can see that there are people of different size and different shape that play handball. And if somebody goes on the floor and is 120 kilos, is heavy to lift. Uh, so there are a few things you need to know about them. Uh, I'll briefly talk about the game demands uh, and how the game has evolved uh, over the years. Uh, some training aspects. A little bit about injuries that you might see, and, and li a little touch on nutrition because I was involved in a project before the London Games. So let's, uh, let's understand something about handball first. Um, first of all, uh, you can uh, clearly see that this uh, infographic was done by a British newspaper uh, because they got the position of the players and the referees wrong uh, on the picture. But uh, uh, this is the Telegraph, by the way, one of the papers I um, had many interactions with over the years. Um, Many important things to know is that handball is a, is, a play, is a game played by six outfield players and one goalkeeper. But the reality of the game is changed because with rolling substitutions, you see a lot of people coming in and out the field. So big teams tend to use uh, all the players they have on roster, so 16 uh, players. Um, the ball size for the men um, uh, is that one, 19 centimeters. And the weight is 475 grams. Uh, and the ball size for the women is slightly smaller, 375 grams. But the characteristics of the games are, are pretty much the same. Uh, it's a team sport, as we said. It's a very simple sport to understand. You pass the ball to each other, and if, if you score more goals than the opposition, you win the game. Uh, a standard match consists of two periods of 30 minutes, uh, and the team that scores most goals wins. It's played on a court of 40 times 20 meters, uh, with a goal at the, uh, in the center of each end. And the goals are surrounded by a six-meter zone where only the defending goalkeeper is allowed. And the goals must be scored throwing the ball from outside the, the zone all while in the air in the zone. So it's, uh, it's quite exciting. Uh, for non-handball countries, when I was in Britain, I was coaching the British team. Everyone was asking me about what is handball. And I used to tell them it's water polo without the water. And then I realized that they didn't know anything about water polo either. So I said it's... Uh, football with the hands and then eventually they got it. Uh, this modern set of rules were published in 1917 so it's a very old game. Uh, the first international games with the new rules were played for men in 1925 and women in 1930 so it's been along for a long time and it was played in the Olympic program for the first time in 1936 in Berlin but was the 11 aside game. So the initial handball uh, movement started on, on a football pitch really. And then he disappeared from the games uh, and reappeared in 1972 in the Summer Olympics in, uh, in Munich. It was a seven-a-side indoor and has been an Olympic sport since. Uh, women's handball was added to the program in 1976 uh, in the Summer Olympics. Uh, and has been having a lot of success in the last few Olympic games, even in countries where there is no, no big history about handball. So the handball arena in London 2012 was sold out uh, and there was a good, uh, a good interest from the media as well. Uh, it's a big sport, it's a worldwide sport. In July 2009, the International Handball Federation listed about 19 million players and about 795,000 teams. So it, it, it is a relatively big deal. But despite the fact that the sport has grown a lot, uh, there is a very small amount of information in the scientific literature. So if, we, if you do a PubMed search or if you do the Web of Science, uh, just putting handball uh, as a keyword search, uh, you find about 795 articles, which is way less than everything you find in any other sport. So science has been somewhat limited. But if you look at the number of papers per year that have been published on handball, there was a uh, very small number until 2000. Then there has been an increase, a decrease, and then it's, it's going up a lot. 
there is always a but, there is always a reason why things like that happen. So I remember when I wrote my first paper about handball in 97, uh, a literature review was very easy to do. It took you about half an hour because there wasn't much. But what happened was that in 2000, there was a modification to the rules. So from that moment on, handball was played with a fast centering in the center, which means that when you score a goal, the team can start to play without waiting for the other team to return. And that has changed the game. And probably that was the trigger for a bit more research. Uh, but let's look at the roles and, and a bit about the anthropometry of the handball players. So uh, positions. In attack, we have wing players, so left wing, right wing, here. Uh, oh, this one. So we have the left wing and the right wing. Then we have backward players, left back, right back, the center back, also called playmaker in some countries and then the pivot or the circle run runner in American terminology. And then you have defensive players currently shaped in, uh, in a probably a 5-1, 3-2-1 defense, but they can be shaped in different ways according to, to the tactics. Uh, key aspects to consider are these people tend to be the fast guys and they have to score jumping from this line most of the times. These people are people that can shoot from long distance and this is the brain of the team in, in very simple things. But the size of handball players is, is, is very, very different. So uh, there is no, no one size fits all. Um, this is quite a curious picture. Um, this was a bit of a sensation in the, in, in the 90s and 2000. Uh, Lyubomir, Lyubomir Vranjes is a Swedish player. And he used to play back or center positions, positions that are normally for uh, very tall people. And he was very successful, one of the best players in the world. But you can see that. There is a, a, a big challenge here when you're trying to argue with somebody that is twice your size. Uh, and when you are playing in attack or defense, you have some physical challenges if you're small. Reality is that the size of the players changes, and this is Angel Montoro uh, from Spain, 2 uh, two meters 12. So data from the last World Championships, the tallest players was uh, Nikolai Markusen, which played here in Qatar for a while, 2 12. And Angel Montoro, they were the tallest players. But if we look at the size of the different positions, of course, there is a goalkeeper. So 191, 95 kilos. Uh, the backs are 192, 94 kilos. Center back, slightly smaller. The wings are the smaller players. And the line player tends to be very big and very, very heavy. But there is, a, there is really a large variability. <laughs> and we will see it. So these are data from uh, Martin Boucher and Claude Karcher and, and his team. They analyzed the anthropometry data that are available online of all major competitions of the last 10 years. And you can see the distribution of players according to size. And you can see that center backs, goalkeepers, pivots, left back, and you can see the average values. But you have a very wide range. Uh, you, you have people that are from 160 to probably about, that's the maximum values, 212, 2 meters, 210. So d you have really a wide range of, of shapes. But the important thing is that uh, height alone is not enough. But uh, while some goalkeepers and backs are as short as 175 centimeters, they can still be selected in national teams. About 77% of the goalkeepers, 75% of the right backs, 82% of the left backs are taller than 190. So if you're small, you can make it, but you need to be pretty special to make it, yes, in particular in these positions. Uh, and if we look at the uh, body mass, uh, this is the same. There is quite a, a wide range of distribution. Uh, there are some heavy <coughs> players here. In particular, some goalkeepers might be very heavy, and the pivots tend to be very heavy and, and very, wide, very, very heavy and very wide people because they tend to be involved in attacking and defensive positions that require a bit of wrestling. Uh, again, height, uh, weight uh, is not terribly important, but the smallest pivot in the European Championship um, and in the European leagues at high level was 184 centimeters tall, but 93% were taller than 185, and they weigh around 100 kilos. And the reason for that is that you get pushed around quite a lot. So if you're heavy and tall, it's more challenging for the defense to move you around. Um, so for uh, talent ID purposes and, and development of talent, over the years there has been a bit of a tendency to gravitate towards selecting tall players. 
Uh, but this tendency seems to have changed a little bit, in particular in, the, in the women's leagues, in women's championships. We don't see a search for the extremely tall players. Actually, the teams that played the final of the Euros about a month ago, they were pretty normal size, apart from a couple of tall girls, whether in the past uh, the Russian team tend to be uh, pretty tall. And in the women's game, in some positions, you, you need to have some tall players, otherwise they can't shoot from the distance. Uh, but it's not the only parameter you need. Uh, physiological characteristics. Uh, there is a variety of papers out there. I just selected a few. Um, everyone wants to know about the VO2 max of, of athletes involved in team sports, uh, which is not really the, uh, what makes the difference between winning and losing, but there you go. Uh, different players of different leagues, of different level. We are talking about, for uh, males, anything between uh, 45 and 60 meals per kilo. Uh, it depends on the position, depends how fit they are, but nothing spectacular there within the range that you observe in every team sport. Another important physical aspect to know is uh, throwing speed, uh, which again is, is very important, but it's not the only thing that you need. But if we just look at throwing speed, uh, these are data I had from uh, our national teams. So uh, Elite players throw faster than non-elite players. And this is a theme that you find in the literature in every sport. But we know that if you play in elite level, you are faster, stronger, taller, bigger than everyone else. And despite this is a well-known thing, people still publish these papers. But anyway, uh, uh, if you just look at throwing speed, uh, the fastest throw is performed when you're fit around the ground and you have two or three steps run in which is like javelin throwing. That's why javelin is thrown with the feet on the ground and not while jumping. Um, the jump shot uh, is slightly uh, less fast than the, than the standing shot and it tends to be faster than the penalty shot. So penalty shot is done when you're not moving, your foot is planted, and then shooting with a run-in, foot on the ground is similar to javelin throwing, and then you have the jump shot, which is the most used uh, shot in handball. And this discriminates between high-level people and, and lower-level people. As been shown by many others, these are data from 1996, 97. So there's a difference between the national team and the second league team. But it's, it's everywhere in the literature you can find that. So what's the throwing speed of, of different athletes? Um, I measured ranges from 80 kilometers per hour to the fastest player I ever measured with a gun, rather, was 122 kilometers per hour. But nowadays, you get people that can throw up to uh, 130 kilometers per hour. But if we look at the literature and you want to know it in meters per second, uh, these are different groups that have been measured with slightly different techniques, mostly radar guns. But people can throw anywhere from 20 to about 30 uh, meters per second. Now, if you think that the uh, area from where you can shoot is 6 meters, that's the closest you can get. But if you jump, you're getting very close to the goalkeeper, uh, and you can get about three to four meters from the goalkeeper, shooting at 120 kilometers per hour, four meters from your face, it's a bit scary. So we will talk about what goalkeepers need to do. Uh, what are the physiological characteristics of, of female players? Again, very similar to other team sports. This is a collection of different papers, different, again, different methodologies of assessing VO2 max, but the highest found was, was Carmen Manchado et al., uh, the Norway national team, which is the current um, European champion and Olympic champion, 55.5 uh, mils per kilo per minute. But again, we are in that magic range of anything between 40 to 60, according to playing position. So again, nothing special there. Uh, the women, thro uh, women thro throw very fast, so women can throw. Uh, and it's, uh, this is the difference between different levels. Uh, the Norwegian second division teams seem to throw faster than the others reported in the literature. Again, range here is anywhere between 15 to <coughs> some players now can reach even 30 meters per second as well. So this ball travels, uh, travels very fast. So these are the characteristics. There is a lot in the literature about jumping ability and, and, and the other aspects of performance. Uh, what we know very well is that you need an all-round uh, physical capacity to play handball. So a bit of archaeology of handball tracking. Uh, this is something we did in 1993. Uh, and we needed two cameras operated by one person each to track one player at a time. Uh, and we had some information about how the players were moving. 
And this is one of the early papers in 1987 in which they showed that heart rate during the game has this pattern and lactate levels have this pattern. The game has changed since then with the rules and, and has evolved a little bit. But I would like to show you a video of how the game has evolved uh, over the years. So this is the 1972 Olympic final. You might recognize somebody here. <laughs> and I want you to focus on uh, the movement of the players, how they move. Oh, I have, I have lots of other things. <laughs> <laughs> the 98 Olympics. This was the final between uh, DDR and uh, Russia. Very interesting game. Look at the size, size of the players as well. This is the European Championships final, uh, 2014. You'll see a fast shot now. And lastly, the people can jump. That's a wing shot. So as you can see, there is a, a lot. It's a lot more dynamic. There's a lot of contact. Um, surfaces have changed. Shoes equipment has changed. But these are very powerful people. They move very fast, and they get in collision with each other uh, many, many times. And in the women's game, you don't see players that are uber tall, as, as you've seen before. So their size has, has slightly changed, but they are a lot faster. OK. So what do they do when they play? What distance they cover? Uh, there's a variety of, of data out there. The most recent ones are from uh, Dr. Lars Mikkelsik, which is here in the audience. But you can see that the distance covered uh, it, you know, ranges from, in average, of, of teams and players ranges from about 2,000 meters uh, all the way up to uh, over 5,000 meters. Now, w what's the problem with that? The total distance covered um, on average by a handball team doesn't tell you anything about what really happens because of the specialism of the roles. So if handball players on average move about 4,500 four meters, in the, in the team you can have people that actually run 4,000 meters or 800 meters and somebody that runs 5,500. So it's a completely different requirement in terms of training. But if we look at the, the details of how they move, so positions first, so wings tend to move uh, quite a lot because they're probably on court a lot. Uh, backcourt players a bit less, pivots a bit less depending on the position. 
and goalkeepers of course move less than the others but they do move but if we look at the details of game demands again this is work for uh, Lars Mikkelsik uh, you know there's a lot of time uh, in men's game they are standing still walking jogging running fast running sprinting there's sideways running backwards running and if you look at the characteristics of the fast running there's a lot of sideways movements so when, when I was a player, we were always coached to run. We were taken on the track, and we were told, OK, you need to, to train and get fit to play handball. But I don't remember running in a circle on a handball pitch. And, and this is still, in some coaching communities, is still, uh, is still purported as, as a way to prepare players. Reality is that most of the high-speed movements you do in certain positions are sideways, not frontal, and you're not running continuously. Uh, what happens between first and second half? Uh, you know, there is evidence that the distance you cover is less, especially at high intensity, but it depends on what the study, where the study was done, what's the group of players. Reality is if you use rotations, overall your team still moves and can retain the same distance cover. But is, it this, is this relevant? Uh, maybe not. And the game demands in women. So the women stand still less than men, but this is a well-known uh, social phenomenon. Uh, but they walk a bit more uh, on a handball court. But in terms of uh, sprinting abilities, there's, there's less distance. So the, the men's game is a bit more intense in terms of accelerations and movements. But the women's game, uh, relative to their uh, aerobic ability, probably has an overall average intensity a bit higher. Uh, this is heart rate we measured, or the time spent in different heart rate zones in, in the British uh, women's team that went to the Olympic Games in a simulation tournament we did for the Olympics. And you can see that. Uh, they do a, a, a game here on the 26th, and then they did uh, a training session on the 27th, then a game on the 27th, a game on 28th, a game on 29th, a game on 30th. And it seems that as the games went on, they were spending more time at low intensity, so walking and standing still. So in the context of long tournaments, if you want to win the World Cup, you've got to win nine games in about 15 days, more or less. So it's quite taxing. If you get fatigued, the most important game is the last game. And there is virtually no research on what people should do in long tournaments, like a real Olympic tournament or a world championship. But these are the demands. And uh, the time spent in a heart rate zone larger than 90% was big in the first game. So everyone goes on the first game, and then you get a bit tired, and you move less, and you are a bit more careful towards the end, especially if you're not terribly fit. If you look at the metabolism, uh, um, few of the studies. Uh, this is work from, again, Martin Boucher and Claude Kercher. I have lots of data that are very similar to that. If you look at the heart rate patterns, it's very intermittent. First half finishes, you recover. Second half, you tend to move. But there is a large variability depending on what your position is. So if you are a left back, a center back, a right back, depending on what you have to do tactically. And this is reflected also in the blood lactate levels, which means metabolism is completely different. You, you know, if you play in a position, depending on the task you have to do. So having a blanket approach to prepare handball players is not possible. You really need to know what the player needs to do in that particular team, in that particular task. And if you look at game rotations and demands, so despite the fact that the game is 60 minutes, um, wings tend to stay on court more than others because they don't have large defensive tasks to do many times in many teams. And backs and pivots tend to be the ones that rotate. So I was analyzing a game the other day. One of the defensive specialists of Slovenia uh, that was beaten by Qatar last night made 33 rotations in and out of the pitch. So I it's a specific role. And then depending on the position you play, you might cover a larger distance. So these are data from Marco Sibila's group in uh, uh, Slovenia. If you play wing and you don't have to defend anywhere near in inside, so you don't have to make many duels. You tend to do just this. You run about 4,880 meters if you defend in 6-0 first position. But if, it, if you defend 3 to one in number 2 and 4, then you run about 1,000 meters more, more or less. So you know, it really depends on what task you have to do. So with this in mind, uh, with the Medical Commission, we um, uh, work with Prozone to develop a bespoke solution to, to really understand what's going on in handball. Uh, during the World Championships. Uh, this is the first game, Qatar-Brazil. Uh, we have a player that tends to play uh, defense and attack quite a lot. And this is the pattern of activity that the player had during the game. So this will inform now what happens in specific roles and specific positions, can inform the coaching teams. 
but also will give us more information on how handball is actually played at the high level. And one of the things we want to know is how that changes it when you play a long tournament, when you have to play many games. So if we look at uh, uh, physical capabilities that are needed, uh, there is a number of papers out there that still keeps writing that aerobic capacity is very important. My question is, I don't think it is, because there is no difference between elite and non-elite in Spanish players. Uh, some papers have shown that the relationship between VO2 max and the number of high-speed acceleration at best was 0.56, which means that you know just a small amount of variance is explained by VO2 max. Uh, so is it really important? But of course it's important if it's very low. So if I measure VO2 max of uh, one of the best teams of, uh, of the World Championships, and I measure my Sunday League team, they, they are much better. So I would say it's important. Reality is that when they are at that level, they are all the same. So the important aspect is moving fast. So improving single sprints, repeated sprints, lateral movements is probably more important. Uh, understanding players' rotations can really help the coach. But the key thing is to make handball players strong, fast, resistant, but they have to put this into the game. There is no point in being fast if you cannot play fast. And that's, that's the mantra that coaches need to use. So what do handball players do in training? They do a variety of things. The structure is very similar to many team sports. So they, they do a warm up. Uh, they do a series of coordination drills that they might do some passing so they get their shoulders ready. Then they, to, they play some situational games. They tend to do a lot of work at half court for tactical reasons. So they prepare defense or attack. And then they do transitions and, and then they play uh, a six side game. So this tends to be what happens. So optimizing, for example, uh, endurance capacity can be accomplished with drills that are well designed. So this is an example of uh, the Italian national team. Uh, and we tried different things, you know, intermittent sprints, 10 seconds on, 20 off, or 3v3 half court. And heart rate can be the same. Blood lactate can be the same. Um, and the average heart rate can be the same. The problem with small-sided games is that they really depend on the quality of players you have. So what, what we used to do and what I used to do when I was coaching was to cluster these activities according to the players' combinations. And then I would have a good idea of the menu. So we knew in this particular team that if we were doing a 7v7 six, a six seven seven game, this was what was happening, a 2v2, a 3v3, a 4v4, a 5v5, a 6v6. Uh, and that, that's a way to, to cluster and characterize activities. Uh, other authors have published that. So again, this is Martin Boucher on the Asp Aspetal Sports Medicine Journal. So if you do a, a small-sided game, or if you do a, um, an intermittent of 15 seconds on at 95% of the maximum heart rate and 50 seconds passive, you get the same physiological responses. And you can uh, cluster and characterize all your drills knowing the duration of the sequence you use and the time you spend uh, at VO2 max or, or near VO2 max or near 95% um, of heart rate. So it is possible to, to use small-sided games if you know what you're doing. Strength training, very important, is very effective. This is data from uh, players of a club that did the European Cups semifinals. Uh, 14 sessions in preseason within a period of about nine weeks, it's possible to improve vertical jumping ability as well as uh, other aspects uh, related to strength. And uh, sorry, the graph on the right, it's a player that was doing strength training uh, from a very early age, from junior teams. And over the years, this is the power velocity curve in a bench press uh, in 99, and this is in 2002. So it's possible to make big improvements. That transfers to throwing speed because it's related to your bench press power. Uh, other authors have done quite a lot of work on this. So this is work from the Tunisian group. Um, recent work, so uh, heavy and moderate load strength training can really help uh, junior and senior handball players. Uh, the improvements can be seen in not only in 1RM, in what you see in the gym, but tends to transfer also in throwing abilities. So, you know, if you don't lift weights, you, you might not get terribly fast. There are other ways to train uh, throwing speed, but strength training seems to be uh, very effective. Um, core stability also seems to bring benefit to throwing speed. This is work from the Norwegian group, Stephen Sales group and Rob van der Tiller. Uh, the control group didn't improve the, the throwing velocity, uh, but the throwing velocity improved in the core stability training group 
However, we have to say that the training group was way better than the control group at the beginning. Fact is that strength training is, is very, very important because uh, handball is a form of legalized wrestling with a ball uh, moving around. So there's a lot of duels, there's a lot of contact, there's a lot of grabbing and pulling. So you need to be strong <laughs> and you need to protect your joints. What about injuries? There is lots of clinical people here. This is the paper from the London Games 2012. Uh, handball players are uh, some of the most frequent clients uh, in the polyclinic of the Olympic Village uh, and they always present with a variety of interesting injuries. Uh, so in London it was no different. It uh, was uh, one of the highest risk sports um, and handball had together with taekwondo. So getting kicked in the head of playing handball it's there or thereabouts uh, in, terms of in terms of risks. And similar data were reported in Beijing games. But again, there are positional challenges. It depends on what you do. So in this case, this is ID Loke playing pivot. Uh, you tend to be in the middle of defense. There is people pulling and pushing you, even when you are in the air, and you land in odd positions while you're trying to, to score. So this is, this is one of the things that can happen. So you can get an injury because you fall on somebody, or somebody's falling on you or you land in the wrong position, or you're trying to shoot, and you are in completely wrong place. Um, if you play backcourt, or you play in the middle of defense, uh, it's physical. So you can get hit in different parts of the body, or pushed. But also, if you are a goalkeeper, look at this position. He's trying to go all the way down, full split. This is a guy that weighs about 110 kilos, two meters tall, goes down full split. The foot locks on the shoe. You get hyper extension on the knee, knee gone. So it's, uh, it's really possible to have different challenges. But I want to focus on one of the specialisms that is emerging at the moment. So this is the work of a defense specialist. Uh, Qatar played against this team last night. So this is Mladen Kozlina. He's a guy that's 199 centimeters, 115 kilos. He covered in the game 1,483 meters. So this is a guy that comes in to defend and gets out very quickly so he's partner can come in and attack. So as a specific task. So I want you to see what he does when he plays. So it's this player here. So contact, contact here, movement, contact, grabs the guy, fold, done. So his role is to be a defensive specialist. And if you look at the pattern here with the pro zone, the fastest movement he does is to get out of the pitch or in the pitch. So how do you train a guy like that? So if we eliminate these two sprints, his actual movement pattern is limited to about two, three meters in each direction. So getting him fit means doing a program that is tailored to that guy. So he needs to be strong, powerful, able to move quickly within one or two meters. He's not doing any sprint in any direction apart to get in and out of the court. Uh, other specialists, goalkeepers. Uh, they do amazing things. They move in a different way as compared to other people. So this is a collection of saves, they tend to be pretty big people, very flexible. They have to use their body in the air quite a lot in odd positions. Look at that one. So if you notice, they tend to look at this safe. Uh, they tend to do a lot of things on one leg. They are on one leg, and they're doing everything else with the rest of the body. And still to date, when I go in gym sometimes, I see people doing squats and Olympic lifts, which are great, but they're done on two limbs. So we should probably think about how we prepare keepers. Look at this one. Same in women, very, very flexible, very fast people. So tasks, again, are different. Uh, and they need to be specified. How is that important? You know, again, 20 to 25 meters shot, a meters per second shot from six meters, you have less than half a second to go and get it. It's fast. And think about the extremes. So if you're trying to reach for a ball in the top corner, the ball is coming at 30 meters per second, and it's hitting you at the extreme. It's a fast rocket. Your elbow might not keep it. So you have to think about how you strengthen goalkeepers in extreme ranges. And they're very important to performance. This is the final of the, of the World Championships 
Last World Championships, Spain destroyed Denmark. 42% save rate for Spain, 31% Denmark. In the first game, Qatar beat Brazil, 47% save rate from one goalkeeper. It makes a big difference. So how do you get injured playing handball? Mostly through contact. Um, jumping and landing, you tend to land on other people's feet or body, or other people tend to land on you uh, if you're in certain positions. Fall and, and other risks, but this is, this, is the, this is what happens. There's a lot of grabbing, pushing, pulling, uh, struggling. struggling. <laughs> uh, also, it's, it tends to be the Angolan team. I don't know why. That's uh, on two pictures, but it, it, you know, it's everything. Everything can happen up here. So, in terms of injury risks and first aid, you need to be ready for things that happen around the head uh, a lot of times. These are the injury sites. So, the head, 17.4 percent, hand and wrist, knee ankle and this is uh, in, in female athletes this is a big survey that was done on 8,000 more than 8,000 players from a very young age and it's actually replicated from young to professional you tend to see the same patterns so injuries all around the body uh, head and neck seem to be predominant because they are trying to get your arms and if they can get your arms they'll get your face just in case uh, and these are the injury sites at major events. Pool data from uh, men and women major events. Again, arms, upper extremity, 18%. Lower extremity, 42%. Uh, the first injury of the World Championships in Qatar was in the first minute of the game with an ankle sprain. It happens. Uh, trunk injuries, they tend to be from landing and head injuries, uh, direct contact most of the times. So we had an end head injury on the first game as well. When do they occur? Uh, they occur during the game. They tend to occur mostly in halfway through the second half, which is when most of the times the game is decided and things get a bit uh, agitated. Uh, and they tend to uh, happen less towards the end when the result is already gone and there is not much to do. So that's when the critical time is. Specific movements to, to, to look after. This is where most of the injuries occur, trying to change direction, especially in female athletes. The forces produced are about three times your body mass. Uh, so it's very important to prepare athletes for sidestepping, cutting maneuvers. And prevention should focus on strategies. So there is lots of papers showing that if you train to do the movement properly, you can prevent uh, uh, some issues of related to injury. Last couple of things. Um, there is a very small amount of data on sweat rate and, and really metabolism per se. Uh, and most of the data, hours included, have been performed in tournaments where there is no crowd. Uh, I have played in crowds uh, and in uh, indoor holes where it gets very hot and, and players can lose uh, more than two kilos during a game. One of the worst places we ever played was a qualification round in Skopje where there were about 5,000 people, a lot of them smoking in the arena, uh, and it, it, it was hot. And our players really struggled with that. What we did was, uh, uh, before the Olympics, we did a simulated tournament with um, the GB uh, women handball team. We saw that the sweat rate was about a liter per hour, more or less, but large variability according to position and time on court. But this was in arenas that were not full of people. As a matter of fact, you can see the temperature. They were relatively cold. And it's a completely bull game when it's a, uh, when it's a full house. But the literature doesn't have a lot of data. On, uh, on male athletes, um, there is one or two papers, very similar values. But again, it's not when, the, when it's crowded, and it's, <coughs> it's a different story. Why is this relevant? Because when you do things like that, you find out a lot of things that are not necessarily what you set to find. So uh, we really uh, wanted to help this team because the coach was concerned about hydration and cramps and the possibility of fatigue. What we found was that the squad fluid intake was one or five uh, liters. Sweat loss mean was 108. So they tended to lose on average uh, some mass uh, during the games, very small negligible amount. But uh, when we looked at fluid intake and sweat loss individually, in 56% of instances the fluid consumption was the same or higher than the sweat loss. So if you leave a lot of bottles of water around the bench, they'll drink it. And the problem is that they might come on the court and they are one or two kilos heavier rather than lighter <laughs> towards the end of the game. Uh, but on no occasion we measure uh, a, a body mass loss larger than 2%. 
which in the literature seems to be indicated as one of these thresholds where you need to be careful with. So, you know, you need to be careful how you advise handball players. If they are on the bench, they get nervous, they might drink. And when they come on court, they are full of fluid. And it's not necessarily a good thing. At the same time, you might have some players that have to play a lot of attack and defense. They get a bit dehydrated. So you need to look at strategies like mouth uh, rinsing with carbohydrates and things like that. We also looked at sweat composition. Uh, this, this paper is now published uh, on International Journal of Sports Nutrition and Exercise Metabolism. But again, the interesting aspect is not the average uh, composition of sweat, but it's actually the squad. So one of the players that tended to suffer from cramps was the one that was sweating the most salt. Uh, and you have two or three players that are over the squad average. There is actually no indication in the literature of what is important, but again, when you look at the individual case, there is somebody that might need specific help and specific support. So to wrap it up, um, this is an American terminology, team handball. Uh, this is a recent review. I it's really a complex sport, like every other team sport. So there's a lot of factors involved in performance, uh, physical aspects, coordination strength, endurance, body shape, nutrition. A uh, lot of aspects of cognition, which I didn't touch on, social factors, team cohesion is very important. It's a group of people that have to fight and do things together, tactics and external influences. Uh, home teams tend to do very well every time they play at home, and we've seen it from Qatar beating Slovenia last night. So there is uh, many factors that need to be looked at. So in summary, uh, handball is a sport involving athletes of different anthropometric and physical characteristics, so you need to be uh, aware of that, people of different shapes play the game. Uh, strength and conditioning efforts should be directed towards improving strength and power, repeated acceleration ability, game specific drills and injury prevention. There's a lot you can do to prevent injuries. The generic game demands are evolving and, and it really depends on the task that the player has on technical and tactical rules of the game. Uh, there is a need to specialize training for players. You know, there is a massive difference, as you've seen, between a defensive specialist and a guy that is playing on the wing. There is limited information in handball. So there is a need to do a lot of research on various aspects of handball to really understand how we can make things better for the players and the coaches. At the moment, there is no idea what the nutritional requirements are. We don't know if there is glycogen depletion in some athletes. We don't know many things. And in particular, we know absolutely nothing about the best strategies to recover in a long tournament like a World Cup or an Olympic game. So more research efforts uh, are needed in various areas, and, and I hope some people here in the community will be uh, involved in pushing the sport even forward. Um, I have to acknowledge a few people. Uh, I would like to thank uh, Dr. Popovich, Cristiano, and Rod for uh, getting me involved again in handball. It's great to, to, to be involved in this sport again. A uh, few colleagues from uh, uh, my time in Italy when I was working there. Uh, colleagues from BOA and GB Handball about the latest projects. Uh, Karim Chamari and his group uh, for the data. He provided me on the Tunisian uh, efforts on research. And uh, Lars Boyk and Mikkelsik from Harris, which is here as well as Prozone. Thank you for your attention. <laughs>